Hey everybody, welcome to For Food's Sake, the podcast bringing you down-to-earth dialogues about the food on your plate and its many impacts on people and the planet. My name is Matteo DeVos, and without further ado, let's talk about food. This week we're having another short Learn By Doing episode on the For Food's Sake podcast. For those of you who don't know, Learn By Doing is the initiative that we take practicing what we preach in sustainability. So rather than just talking about the issues, we're actually trying to look for certain solutions and to implement them in our in our daily lives. This week, we'll be talking about the Merit360 initiative that I recently got involved in. Uh, Merit360 is part of the World Merit Program, which brings uh, 360 young individuals together to develop an action plan to tackle the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, SDGs for short. And the World Merit Program is um, an online platform, uh, a network of individuals around the world that are taking local action to increase sustainability initiatives. And it's, it's very much a collaboration of scaling different projects and ideas uh, around sustainability. Now, my focus is on SDG number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. And one of the main goals of this uh, sustainable development goal is to cut per capita food waste at retail and consumer levels by 55% by the year 2030. And so what I want to address specifically um, in this Merit360 program, and I'll explain a little more how Merit360 works, is to address the sustainable consumption um, issue through the lens of food. So looking specifically at concrete ways of reducing food waste and how we can incentivize uh, sustainable consumption habits. So to just put this in a bit of context, the issue of food waste um, is an enormous issue globally. We're speaking of 1.3 billion tons of food uh, being wasted every year, while at the same time, over a billion people are undernourished and over a billion people a year go hungry. So what we have here is a, a complete systematic misuse of natural resources, in which almost everyone plays a part, and in which most of us uh, contribute in some negative way to, to upkeeping these unsustainable consumption patterns. Now, to put this into perspective, um, there's an awful contradiction that we currently have uh, between the enormous food waste on the one side and the current food losses that we're experiencing globally, specifically in the last month or so, in the last years actually, but more in, 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 in the news in the last couple of months in East Africa through the drought uh, that's now in its third consecutive year and the famine that's emerging in Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia, specifically in the Horn of Africa, but also in Nigeria and Yemen and in South Sudan, uh, linked as well to the the violence and conflict in these countries. And so what we're we're seeing here um, is while on the one side we have an enormous food waste issue um, it's very much complemented and shouldn't be separated from the reality that is the famine in Somalia that's currently taking place, the food prices that are skyrocketing, the crop harvests that are well below normal levels, the livestock that are decimated. I mean, if you look at Somalia more specifically, we're talking about um, over half the population, over 6 million people that are currently uh, facing real risk of famine or are already experiencing famine. In total, this issue is affecting over 20 million people. The UN humanitarian chief, Stephen O'Brien, he described it to the Security Council at the UN as the, the largest crisis we've been facing since 1945. He's asked for $4.4 billion in aid needed to avert the crisis. And so I'll be adding a, a link to donate in the description as well. So you can see here how much... And this is very much to do with climate change, how drought exacerbated by the El Nino climate phenomenon this year is is devastating countries. And I think it's important to note that um, in the case of Ethiopia, for example, it's the fastest growing economy not only in Africa but in the world. It's quite devastating to see the impact that this famine is having on these countries. 
Last week, I was in Mozambique uh, for work, and I got a chance there as well to talk to some people locally about the drought situation there, which hasn't necessarily been making headlines in the West, but which has been also very dire. It's affected over 1.5 million people, especially in the north of the country, where it's been destroying maize crops and affecting livestock, uh, maize crops being the staple food of the country. Obviously, when you hear stories like this, when you hear information and statistics on such a mass scale, it can be quite overwhelming, and it can it can feel like there's not much that we can really do. And so I think it's important to note, and this is how I'll start this podcast, by highlighting some of the solutions that I came across in Mozambique, specifically, uh, to these situations of drought and what people are trying to do to combat and prevent these type of uh, scenarios from playing out in the future. I think it's important to stay positive, and the whole initiative with Merit360 is also to realize that collectively, with local initiatives, we can make small but concrete impacts in different parts of the world. So, one of the first initiatives that I came across when I was in Mozambique that I found found particularly inspiring was... um, the work of a Mozambican civil engineer called Elino Kello, who I'd love to have on the show at some point, who designed a software that uses real-time climate data to help farmers in the region better harvest rainwater. Uh, it's been shortlisted for the Africa Prize of Engineering Innovation from the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, it's, it's a software that uses um, live precipitation data from NASA weather satellites and relays that data to farmers via a mobile app. And so it gives them vital information on the best time and place to harvest their rainwater and reservoirs uh, during the dry season. And it also spreads information on water management. So what are the best practices of harvesting rainwater on small-scale farms um, when you only have rooftops or collection tanks uh, to work with? It also provides information based on the farmer's location on average rainfall figures, and then the software helps you determine how much water um, can be harvested every day and month and help you plan accordingly. So this is just one of many small-scale solutions that might help local farmers in different parts of the world face the reality that is climate change. Another initiative that I came across on a much broader scale and probably much more controversial is a project called the Pro Savanna Project, which is a triangular project between the Mozambican, Brazil, Brazilian, and Japanese government to be implemented along the Nakala Development Corridor, which is a corridor in the north of the country, in the north of Mozambique, which in theory uh, could cover about 11 million hectares of land. So it's an enormous project that aims to convert small-scale subsistence agriculture into commercial agriculture. So in other words, the idea here is to transform these small-scale projects into industrial mega farms producing soybeans. And the idea, the vision behind that is that the Nikala Corridor then becomes a, a sort of granary that can feed the country and produce a surplus for export. And the main buyers of these soybeans would be Japan and China for their hog farms uh, to use the soybeans for, for feed. And this project actually stems from a similar project that was undertaken in Brazil in the Brazilian Sahado, which is a tropical savanna region in Brazil, where quite a remarkable transformation took place in the 80s and 90s. So here you had a region, the savanna, which was considered completely inhospitable to agriculture. I mean, nobody ever thought any of these soils were going to be productive. Fast forward to today, And the Sahado accounts for more than 70% of Brazil's farm output, which is quite remarkable. So what you have here is, over the period of 10 years, soil that was considered nitrogen deficient, that was too acidic, um, that generally wasn't going to be used for agriculture, was transformed into Brazil's breadbasket, essentially. It was the Brazilian... Agricultural Resource Corporation, a public company that initiated these dramatic changes. I mean, to give you an example, to deal with the acidity of the soil, 
they poured industrial quantities of lime onto the soil to reduce the levels of acidity. And their scientists also bred varieties of rhizobium, which is a bacterium that helps fix nitrogen in legumes and which seemed to work particularly well in the soil of the Sahado, and so that reduced the need for fertilizers. Now, as with all big projects and and initiatives, there's, of course, an enormous amount of controversy surrounding the Brazilian Sahado, and you can read up on that, and I'll provide some links in the description. But my goal here really is to give you a bit of an overview and understanding as to how this project came to be introduced in Mozambique. So now going back to Mozambique, with Brazil in mind, the idea very much was to use the same techniques, the same technology that was used in Brazil, and export that with these Brazilian big agribusiness companies to Mozambique. Now what of course already makes this project much more controversial is the fact that you have foreign direct investment, you have Brazilian big agribusiness coming into Mozambique coming into the Nicala Corridor, which is one of the most densely populated areas of rural Mozambique. And so you, of course, have many small-scale farmers that think these big agribusinesses are coming under a false pretense, that their livelihoods are at stake. Combine that with the relatively strong land laws that you have in Mozambique that originate from land rights struggles during the independence movement. And you've got yourself a situation in which civil society is very much against what they perceive as land grabs by foreign Brazilian big agribusiness. Now, the extent to which that is true is always debatable, but we definitely do have here, and I think this is the message to take away from it, is you have a complex interplay of history, civil society, local farmers, foreign direct investment, and different governments all lobbying and all with different interests, trying to find a solution to what is essentially an enormous problem. Um, Continued droughts, food insecurity, and as is the case for the Japanese and Chinese governments that are buying the soybeans from Mozambique for the hog farms for feed. It's a matter also of meeting increasing meat consumption demands. So now you're probably wondering, how does all of this relate to Merit360? The first weeks and months of the program are dedicated to research. Now, in this research phase, I think it's vital that if we're going to be coming up with local solutions to local problems, either in terms of food waste or food loss, which we just talked about, which I think are basically two sides of the same coin, I think it's important that we benchmark the projects and initiatives that are already out there. What I mean by that is is that it's important to reach out to the wider community and learn about the projects and initiatives out there that work with similar issues and find out what has worked and what hasn't, what mistakes have been made and and what can we learn from them and how can we improve. We can save a lot of time and energy if we avoid duplicating the mistakes of projects in the past and duplicating work that has already been done and it has proven to be ineffective. Now, we're very much still in the early stages and As a group working together on the SDG 12, we've only met once virtually on Skype. I'm excited to say that it's a very diverse group. We have a diverse range of professional backgrounds. Geographically, too, we're from everywhere from Vienna to Kurdistan to California. It's a great international group. So I think we'll be able to come up with some interesting ideas. Now, in terms of my own preliminary ideas and what I've been thinking about, I'm particularly interested in finding out more about what drives behavioral change, what truly incentivizes meaningful and lasting changes in consumption patterns. And I think this is crucial because I think we're at a stage now, at least in Western societies, that we're all very much aware that we at least ought to change our consumption patterns. We're aware that we should eat more sustainably, consume more modestly, and generally reflect more on the way that we interact with our surroundings. But that doesn't mean that on a day-by-day basis we actually change our consumption patterns. Take an extreme example, and this was an example that was brought up on the first Skype chat that I was talking about earlier of the SDG12 group. So consider this scenario. You're at an international conference about one of the Sustainable Development Goals hosted by the United Nations, 
and there you have in front of you, sitting on your desk, two plastic bottles of water. And you soon realize that everyone sitting around you in the conference hall has the same. Now, while these two plastic water bottles may seem to you like a harmless, negligible addition to global plastic waste, to me that epitomizes the problem that we're facing. No one's willing to take individual responsibility. And if even at a conference hosted by the United Nations, in which you'd expect to find scientists and experts on all sorts of sustainability issues, if even in these conferences, attended by those that probably know best out of all of us what the consequences are of our inaction, if even here you can't get people to practice what they preach, then surely our information campaigns up to now have been, at best, insufficient or inadequate. And that really begs the question, what will it take for us to change? What will it take for us to shift our consumption habits? What incentives actually work? And up to this point, information campaigns have been all about reminding people or pushing people into behavioral change, telling them that they should or they ought to do this and that. And so what you have is sustainable consumption and sustainability in general comes across as a chore. And if that's the case, then I think you've already lost. Once something becomes a chore, the chance of it becoming a habit, an unconscious reflex, becomes slimmer and slimmer. So. In the coming weeks and months, I'll be reaching out to you, to organizations that are working with food waste in Europe, uh, to different networks and different people that might have different ideas, and of course, brainstorming all of our ideas with the SDG 12 Merit 360 group. So if you have any suggestions, any of your own ideas or thoughts about how we can best tackle some of these food waste problems, um, please reach out to me. Or if you have any companies in mind or organizations that are working with food waste in innovative, disruptive, and inspiring ways, then do let us know. For those of you that don't know, I'm also still fundraising for the Merit360 program. Each participant of the Merit360 program has to raise a minimum of $1,500. That is before we meet at the end of August in person at a week of conferences and workshops in London and in Liverpool. And that's also where we'll be working together with uh, UN experts and with other individuals and where we'll also be presenting our ideas to the British Parliament in London. And so like I said, I'm still working towards reaching that goal of $1,500. So, so if you'd like to contribute to that goal, I'll also be providing the fundraising link in the description below. Last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be adding A link in the description below for donations for the current famine that's taking place in Somalia and in South Sudan and Nigeria and Kenya and Ethiopia. Okay, well, that is all I have for this week, guys. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode or if you enjoy other For Food's Sake episodes, then I'd highly appreciate if you rate, review, and subscribe to the For Food's Sake podcast on iTunes or on other podcast apps that you might be using. It goes a long way in helping the podcast reach people that might be interested, that haven't heard of it before, so it's very much appreciated. And of course, you can share it with your friends and family. Uh, You can like us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. And finally, of course, you can find all of the episodes and similar articles and thoughts on our website on www.forfoodsake.me. Thanks a lot. I'll see you next week. (laughs) 